Welcome to CQC Connect, the podcast from the Care Quality Commission. I'll now hand you over to Victoria, who will introduce this episode. Thank you. In this episode, we're going to explore CQC's latest report called Protect, Respect, Connect, Decisions About Living and Dying Well During COVID-19. This is CQC's review of Do Not Attempt Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation Decisions During the COVID-19 Pandemic. My name is Victoria Watkins and I'm the Deputy Chief Inspector for Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care here at CQC. I've led on the development and delivery of this review since it was commissioned by the Department of Health and Social Care back in October 2020. We're going to spend time discussing the report, its findings and what the recommendations mean for you. I'm very pleased to be joined by my colleague Rosie Bennyworth, Chief Inspector of Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care. And also, I'd like to welcome Usha Grieve, Director of Partnerships and Services at Compassion in Dying. A very warm welcome to you both. You've both played an active role in this review's journey. But let's start by you introducing yourselves and why this topic is so important to you. Over to you, Rosie Bennyworth. Hi, Victoria. I'm Rosie Bennyworth. I'm the Chief Inspector of Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care at the CQC. Um, This review is really important to me. It's vital uh, that we ensure that people... um, are able to make uh, decisions, informed decisions about their health and care, and they're able to feel empowered to do that in a way that uh, they feel that they've got the information to be able to do that. I'm a GP by background, and I've had many of these conversations over the years. And um, it's really important to me that we uh, uh, have these conversations in a way that's caring and compassionate, and um, enables people to be fully involved in their decision making about their health. Thank you Rosie and over to you Usha. Thanks, Victoria. Um, So, yeah, my name's Usha and I work for Compassion in Dying and we're a national charity that supports people to make decisions um, and plan their end of life care. And DNA CPR decision making has just such a massive impact on the people that we support. And that's both in terms of their quality of life in the present and also the end of life experience that both they and their family members have. And, And we hear about this from all ends of the spectrum. So from the positive impact that having a do not resuscitate form can can have um, to the the negative impact that happens when they're communicated badly. So I'm hugely passionate really about getting this right. Thank you both, such an important area. So let's hear therefore to the review and take the conversation um, through uh, a series of questions, if that's okay. So firstly, uh, Rosie, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shone a spotlight on the need to hold and improve the quality of conversations about advanced care planning, including DNA CPR decisions. Could you tell us a bit about why this review came to be and what we found? Yes, certainly. So um, we started hearing some concerns being raised uh, with us at the start of the pandemic. And the concerns we were hearing at that stage were really about the blanket use of DNA CPR Um, decisions. And when I say blanket, I mean that they were being used over groups of people without um, consideration for an individual's needs, which is is never acceptable. Um, And the law is very clear that these uh, decisions should be made on an individual basis in consultation with the uh, with the person involved wherever possible. Um, we also heard concerns about the appropriateness of uh, DNA CPR decisions more generally, um, and we heard a lot of stories about how people um, didn't feel engaged or involved in the decision making, and um, also from their families and loved ones who who also didn't feel that they'd been involved in the conversations. Um, so as a result of that, we were commissioned by the department to undertake uh, at the Department of Health and Social Care to undertake um, this review. Um, I think what we've learned through the review is that um, these 
um, problems and these issues with DNA CPR um, have been long standing. They predate the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has exposed them to a greater degree. Um, we've seen um, issues, we have heard of a lot of good practice, which is fantastic, and we have shared that in our report. And it's really important to that. Um, a lot of people have good discussions and we want to learn from um, what happens in those good discussions and encourage all areas to look at how they can embed that good practice. We've also seen some worrying um, findings uh, around uh, the um, use of DNA CPRs. In an ideal world, as Usha said earlier, they should be used as part of a broader advanced care planning discussion so people understand whether they should go into hospital, whether they want to be admitted to hospital, whether they want to have um, other treatments such as antibiotics or ventilation or, or um, have a broader discussion um, and not just discussing uh, resuscitation on its own. Um, and we found that often um, those broader discussions were not um, were not held. And those discussions sometimes were not held in a caring, compassionate way that really allowed a person to think through what their options were, have the information in an accessible way, and to be able to make an informed decision. We also found that there was a whole mixture of policies, procedures, tools being used right across the country which added to the confusion and added to some of the poor practice. And we found that very often there was a lack of oversight and um, a lack of information that enabled people leading um, both uh, providers of health and care services and system leaders to be able to understand what, uh, what is going on in their systems. So um, a variety of good practice, but a lot of areas that uh, we feel there need to be improvements in. Great, thank you, Rosie. So recognising that these issues predate the pandemic and also the significance of the review's findings, there are a number of recommendations uh, included to the report, which I encourage all podcast listeners to read. But Rosie, would you be able to share an overview of those recommendations? Yes, certainly. Um, We've set out a comprehensive set of recommendations, starting with the need for a ministerial oversight group to understand the issues that we've raised in our report in more detail, and then to make sure that these are taken forward. Um, We've then set out our recommendations in three areas, firstly around information, training and support. And we want to make sure that um, providers make sure that the that clinicians um, ensure that people are involved in these conversations. Um, these really important conversations need to be um, with the individual involved and that needs to ensure that um, people have the right decision making tools uh, to be able to help them make those decisions. Um, secondly, we want um, integrated care systems to make sure that um, they consider diversity, inequality and mental capacity factors when they're doing their planning um, for, for their local populations. And the final training, um, the final uh, recommendation in this uh, section is around how we make sure that there's clear, consistent training standards and guidance for people across all sectors. Um, we then move on to a series of recommendations around a consistent national approach to advanced care planning. Firstly, we are calling for a national campaign to ensure that people understand what good looks like around a DNA CPR um, and that they are informed about what they should expect and uh, there should be a positive promotion around having these conversations as part of a broader advanced um, care planning conversation. Secondly, um, we want to make sure that there are consistent national tools around policy guidance and tools um, that everyone can follow um, to allow uh, that consistent approach right across the country. And thirdly, we want to make sure that information is shared in a timely way. And we think that to do that, there needs to be better a digital compatibility between all systems in local areas. The final area of recommendations is around improved oversight and assurance. The first recommendation here is to make sure that records are comprehensive and that their standards of records and documentation um, that the providers uh, ensure are kept to. 
Secondly, we want to make sure that there's a consistent data set and metrics that integrated care systems look at. Um, and then we've asked the National Gardens Office to lead on the, the third recommendation in this section, which is about how do we support people to speak up about any concerns they have about DNA CPR and to raise those concerns and make sure they're listened to and acted upon. Finally, the last recommendation is for the CQC as an organisation to make sure that we continue to seek assurance that people are at the centre of these decisions. Um, and we will ensure a continued focus on uh, DNA CPR decisions through our monitoring, assessment and inspection of all health and adult social care providers. Thank you, Rosie. A really helpful overview there on the recommendations. What we've heard is that it's important to highlight that when done in the right way, conversations around end of life planning can be positive for all involved. Could I ask you both to share your thoughts on what a good advanced care planning discussion looks like? Usha, if I can come to you first, please. I think um, fundamentally good advanced care planning puts the individual themselves at the front and centre of the conversation and of the decision making process. So it asks what matters to a person and it's uh, kind of explores with honesty, you know, what their treatment and care options are. I, I think certainly through my experience of having these conversations with people, people really want to be listened to um, and they also want honesty as well and they want to have an opportunity to kind of talk about their priorities um, but something I'm really passionate about is that we it's we can't just stop at the conversation so um, I don't think that talking about um, end of life is enough and that we have to support people to kind of document their um, care preferences as well so that they're known about and that and so that they can be implemented and and if we just focus on talking and not also on recording we're doing people a disservice really by creating a narrative which says that talking about what you want at the end of life is enough to achieve a good death I, I think all three elements are needed for good quality advanced care planning so talking recording and implementing Thank you, Usha. And and to you now, Rosie, anything that you would add in terms of what a good advanced care planning discussion would look like? I agree with uh, Usha's points completely. I think the importance of, of having time, um, undertaking these conversations at an appropriate time for people and under, undertaking them in a way that is caring compassionate and sensitive these are really important factors and we need to make sure that um, these are not snatched conversations uh, on on the edge of a ward round and or these are not um, these are not things that uh, just happen on the end of a phone out of the blue these are important conversations we need to make sure they happen at an early stage um, and we need to encourage people to uh, to start the conversation if they feel ready to have it. And to flag for listeners, our report does contain examples of where we found and what good practice looks like. And it's really important for us to share those. So I would encourage all to read and look for those examples. Compassion in Dying signed a joint statement with many other partners, Usha. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, so the the statement was really in response to some media coverage around DNA CPR decision making, um, which at one point was perhaps only telling one side of the story. And we really wanted to make sure that, you know, in, in, in line with what Rosie was just saying about um, the importance of good quality end of life conversations, we wanted to ensure that the goals of um, properly pre personalised care and advanced care planning were not presented as inherently at odds with living well at the end of life um, and to make sure that alongside the storytelling of the, the you know the uh, appalling impact that poor communication and decision making has had on people and their families that also the voices of people who actually want a DNA, uh, DNA CPR decision um, or the voices of people who felt that their loved, loved one's death 
was better because of uh, because CPR was not given, that their voices were also told. So nearly 40 clinicians and healthcare charities and campaigners all came together to highlight the importance of good communication and um, proper DNA CPR decision making and also to commit to learning from the experiences of the people impacted by the pandemic, uh, by the poor practice during the pandemic. Thank you, Usha. Such important messages there in that statement. Compassion in Dying have also published the report, Better Understanding, Better Outcomes, What We've Learned About DNA CPR Decisions Before and During the Coronavirus Pandemic. Usha, what what did you find? Well, the main thing that we found was that there is a a huge range of experiences when it comes to DNA CPR decision making and communication, which I know is echoed in the CQC's report as well. Um, We realised at Compassion in Dying several years ago that do not attempt CPR was a recurring theme in calls to our information line. Um, But when the pandemic began, the proportion of calls on that topic actually doubled. So we analysed calls over that, uh, I think it was a four year period, and it was really clear that poor or non-existent communication created so much anxiety and distress for people and families. You know, it really does leave a trail of devastation for many people. And, And that's a legacy that lives on in a family long after someone has died. But what was really interesting in the conversations that we were having with people was that for the people that we were speaking to, often, you know, when somebody experienced um, distress about a DNA CPR decision, that distress was caused by the poor communication and not the decision itself. So, you know, people would call us um, really upset because they'd found um, a, a DNA CPR form in a family member's discharge notes, and they were really shocked and they didn't know what it mean, didn't know what it meant, and they didn't know what they should do. But when we took the time to talk to them about their situation and explain what CPR is, you know, what it means, uh, what C- what the limitations of CPR are, and importantly, that just because you have a DNA CPR form, it doesn't mean you won't get other appropriate care and treatment. Generally, people actually got it and they understood why the decision was made. And mostly um, people were just really appreciative of an opportunity to feel heard and to talk about it. And uh, another thing that we found, and I think this is really important, is that actually most of the people who were calling us for support and, and information around CPR decision making were doing so because they wanted the reassurance of a DNA CPR form. So lots of people um, in the UK feel strongly that CPR would not be right for them and they want to do something about this. And they told us that having a DNA CPR form gives them um, peace of mind. Um, and then the other thing, if I may, I think that's really interesting and important to kind of bear in mind as we're thinking about moving forwards and improving practice kind of now and beyond the pandemic is that we did some polling alongside this analysis and it found that actually three quarters of people would be willing to have a discussion about CPR if a clinician brought it up with them. Even if that discussion worried them, they'd still be willing to have the conversation. And only 6% of people said they wouldn't want to talk about it. And I think that's really significant because there's a lot of... um, I hear a lot of conversations about death being a taboo, and I hear a lot of... um, a uh, lot of conversations about how end of life discussions are, are difficult in inverted commas. Um, and I think it actually um, hampers any efforts to improve these conversations by approaching it, thinking, you know, off the bat that people are going to be um, upset by the conversation or that they don't want to have it. And it would be much more helpful for people if we just relabeled these conversations as important. Thank you, sir. So um, shared and um, similar um, findings at the two reports working uh, hand in hand uh, there. So, um, so Rosie, in, in terms of uh, CQC, ca- can we hear about the actions CQC are taking against providers who were known to issue inappropriate DNA CPR. So we've we've taken several courses of action over the last year during the pandemic. Um, firstly, we wrote out to all providers um, back at the beginning of the first wave of the pandemic, um, explaining that it was completely inappropriate and unacceptable for anyone to be making blanket um, DNA CPR decisions. We have then uh, heard uh, from several people who contacted us pe- uh, over the last um, few months, and we have followed 
all of those uh, those incidents up. Um, our inspectors have been making contact with providers um, where we hear any concerns being raised. Um, if we um, if we haven't been able to gain assurance um, that the providers are dealing with that appropriately, um, and we outlined in our interim report um, last year how important it was for providers to get that assurance themselves that all DNA CPR decisions are appropriate. Then if we haven't been able to get that assurance ourselves, then we will inspect providers and we will see what they are doing and we will um, take uh, any action we need to um, to ensure that uh, blanket, any form of blanket DNA CPR um, approach is stopped. And we, we need to also make sure that the quality of these DNA CPR decisions are as good as possible. So we will um, we will encourage uh, the providers to look at what they are doing and how they can improve their processes. The final thing just to mention is that we are looking at this through our inspection framework and our assessment framework um, and we are training our inspectors to know how to ask about this and, and what to look for. So uh, we are uh, undergoing on ongoing work um, around this area and we will continue to make sure that we, uh, what we do leads to the improvements in the system uh, that we so desperately need to see. Thank you Rosie, such an important issue, we really must all keep talking about this. Uh, so to you both now, what, what are the next steps to drive the findings and recommendations forward? Oh sure, if I can come to you first please. Um, I completely agree with the um, CQC's recommendations about um, a public awareness campaign. I think we really need to encourage people to think about and discuss CPR and other treatment wishes. Um, and these conversations, you know, they need to happen as early as possible, you know, not just passed along uh, the next clinician in line until it's so late in that person's healthcare journey that um, you know they they can't participate in decisions or there isn't time um, for it to kind of be thought through or for a proper discussion to be had. I think there's really a low awareness of the tools available under the Mental Capacity Act. So things like advanced decisions and lasting powers of attorney. Um, I think these. Things are often seen as kind of too big to deal with. People say things like, oh, I just don't know where to start. But we know that when they're in place, it can have a massively positive impact on the quality of someone's end of life experience. So I, I think there's lots of free support out there and practical tools which which help um, with those sorts of things um, for, from lots of charities. Um, including Compassion in Dying. Um, I also think that a consistent approach to advanced care planning would make a massive difference to people feeling like they're able to do these things and have these discussions. But people tell us time and time again that they're genuinely baffled by terminology and that they research something, you know, whether that's to do with CPR decision making or other end of life decisions, um, only to find out when they go to their GP that actually what they've looked up isn't in use in that in their area. And um, that sounds really small, but actually it's not. I think it's barriers like that that stop people from planning ahead when they want to. And I think there needs to be a clear national approach to end of life record keeping and information sharing as well. So in my mind, it's just totally unacceptable that a person might not receive the treatment or care that's right for them because their wishes can't be accessed in the right place um, at the right time. And, and finally, I, th I think clinicians have to feel supported to raise the topic of end of life planning. So yes, definitely, this is about better training to have these important conversations really sensitively, but it's also about creating a, a culture that doesn't vilify doctors for raising the topic of DNA CPR. And I think there's a, a job to do to real, possibly um, re rebuild trust between people and clinicians that I think for some people has been eroded due to some coverage of decision making during the pandemic. Thank you, Usha. And to you, Rosie? Yes, yeah, so I think Usha's um, summed it up very beautifully. Um, I think from the CQC point of view, we will um, we will be looking forward to the establishment of the Ministerial Oversight Group to make sure that, that uh, these recommendations are followed through and they do happen. And we are looking forward to working with all of our um, other partners across the health and care system and the voluntary sector um, and uh, all a, a variety of other groups to make sure that actually we all take our part in uh, leading these improvements and driving these improvements. We will continue to, to um, follow things up 
very carefully at the CQC and as the independent regulator, I think we will be asking lots of questions to, to make sure these improvements are happening and, um, and make sure that uh, people are getting the care that they absolutely need. This has been really great. Enormous thank you to you both for joining us today and sharing your views. You can find out more about Protect, Respect, Connect, the report on CQC's website at www.cqc.org.uk. And we're also using a shared hashtag to collectively highlight the importance of advanced care planning being centred on the needs of the individual. And that hashtag is Talk End of Life Care. Please do share it, talk to it across social media and join the conversation. So thanks to you now for listening and taking part in today's podcast. We've lots more upcoming podcasts at CQC, so join us next time. Thank you. Mm-hmm.